We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, and wherever you find your podcasts. How well does everyone get on in your family? Are there some members who refuse to speak to each other? Sometimes it happens slowly through divorce, other times all of a sudden after a big family row, but the result is the same. Silence, estrangement, and not inviting someone to a big family occasion like a wedding. I'll be looking at this problem from two angles next week, why adult children might cut contact with their parents. But on today's edition of The Meaningful Life, I'll focus on the parents. What to do if your son or daughter are estranged? And that probably means that you don't see your grandchildren too. Or if they hold you at such a distance, never telling you anything, seldom inviting you to anything, and visiting for the shortest time possible, that it feels like estrangement in all but name. My witness is Dr Joshua Coleman, who's a clinical psychologist and senior fellow at the Council on Contemporary Families. He is also the author of Rules of Estrangement, Why Adult Children Cut Ties and How to Heal the Conflict. Now, you specialise in estrangement counselling, and you describe the parents arriving in your office with three feelings. And I can almost sort of see them when you say these three things. They're sad, they're scared, and they're pissed off because actually they've been really quite devoted parents. So tell me more. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that every single parent that I work with has all three of those feelings. For some, it's, you know, one feeling is much more prominent than the other. For some, it might be shame. Others, it might be guilt. Others, it might be anger, particularly fathers, I find. But sad, certainly, because for most parents, the idea of never seeing their children and often grandchildren again is a, a terrible reality. So it's something that they feel deeply sad about and also scared that they'll never see them again. And, you know, sometimes pissed off because really a lot of the parents who are becoming estranged today were in many ways some of the most dedicated, educated, conscientious parents of almost any other generation. So they feel like, you know, they're being accused of being emotionally abusive and neglectful and harmful and tra traumatizing to their children. And a lot of parents in older generations feel like, you have no idea how good you have it. I can show you a, you know, a harmful, abusive parent. I grew up with one. So there's this enormous generational divide between uh, the parents and adult children today. So what is particularly interesting is you also see the children as well, separately to start off with. So how do they arrive? Well, I think the best explanation was by an Australian psychologist, Nick Haslam, who wrote an article called Concept Creep. And one of the things that Haslam found was then the past three decades or so, there's been an enormous expansion of what we consider to be harmful, abusive, traumatizing, or neglectful behavior. And so younger generations have been raised with those concepts. They've gone to therapists who've said that, you know, the way your parent treated you was harmful or abusive or neglectful or traumatizing. And the parents grew up in a very different generation where that kind of criteria was very, very different, much stricter in many ways, much higher Haslam calls it a concept creep because it's just the idea of what we consider to be problematic behavior has greatly expanded. So the adult children are coming into, into family therapy saying, yeah, you abused me, you neglected me, you traumatized me. And the parents are going, I have no idea what you're talking about. And what is so extraordinary about your book is that you talk about your own experiences as well, because this actually happened to you your adult daughter said, you were not there for me. Yeah, I was married and divorced in my 20s and have an adult daughter who I'm very close to again. But there was a period of time in her early 20s where she cut off contact for a few years in large part due to my remarrying and her feeling displaced by my new marriage and my children from my current marriage. And at the time, there was really nothing written to help. And so I made all the mistakes that every other parent seems to make, which was to be more 
you know, guilt tripping or defensive or <laughs> demanding. And of course, that didn't bring her any closer to me. So it was really only learning how to be empathic and taking responsibility and finding the kernel, if not the bushel of truth in her complaints that really caused her to become reinterested in, in healing the relationship. As a result of that, I wrote my first book on the topic, When Parents Hurt, in 2007 and got a large following of estranged parents in the U.S. and in other Anglophone countries. And since then, I've been doing webinars for estranged parents and a free Q&A and research. So I've been really steeped in this arena for quite a while now. And I think what was really interesting was that being a divorced parent and actually seeing your daughter very infrequently, you became a sort of a Disney dad that you didn't want to have any conflict at all. So when the conflict did arrive, because, you know, parents and children conflict goes together like, you know, a horse and carriage, you hadn't really got anything to fall back on. Well, that's the thing, you know, when you're you were only going to see your kid every other weekend and every Wednesday night, which was sort of the common structure, you know, when I was divorced years ago. You don't really want to poison that with a lot of rules or conflict or things that are going to make your child happy. You kind of want to just maximize the time that you have so you do become kind of a Disneyland dad because you don't want to, you know, because if you do make your kid unhappy, you might not see them again for another week or 10 days. And who knows what's going to happen the next time that you see them. Yeah, because you need a couple of days sometimes to get over it. You know, if they go into a sulk and they won't speak for 48 hours, exactly. then you're passing over a silent child. And then what's your partner going to do or your ex-partner going to think about this? And it's really difficult. Well, particularly with you have an ex, and I'm not speaking from personal experience per se, but, you know, if you have a divorce, you got divorced for a reason. And so if you're doing shared custody, you have no control over what your ex is saying. And your ex may well try to exploit the conflicts that you're having with your child and make the division even worse. So that's, you know, in my research, I found that 70 percent of parents who were estranged had a prior divorce. And it just highlights the way that divorce can really fracture relationships between parents and adult children, or parents and children at any age, frankly. So how old was your daughter when you had what you call the talk? Probably early 20s, maybe 23, something like that. So what is the talk? (laughs) Well, Well, there was her talk, which was telling me that she felt like I hadn't been there for her, that she felt neglected, that she felt like I prioritized my second family over hers, that she didn't feel valued. I mean, that was the talk, which was very, very painful. Not not anything that I would ever want to, to revisit again. So, yeah, that was the talk. And I can sort of guess without any trouble at all what you said, which was, oh, no, you're wrong. And this is how it really was. Am I right? Some version of that. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I'm a psychologist, so I was a little more sophisticated than that, but I didn't go nearly far. But you were a human being. I was a human being, exactly. I was certainly far more defensive. I was certainly not nearly able to do a deep enough dive into empathizing with what she was thinking and feeling and really kind of honoring her experience in a way that she really needed me to do and to be in order for her to feel really understood. And how long was it that you didn't have any contact with her for? It was several years. I mean, there might be the occasional contact, but it was very, you know, it was fraught and distant. So it was, you know, it was at least a couple of years or so. And I think what is really difficult about this is it's still even today, it's a bit of a closeted problem that people don't talk about. Yeah, for parents in particular, it's an object of great shame. Now, for adult children, it's an object of shame as well. But for the adult child, there can be a lot of upside to it. You know, for the adult child, you can have support from your therapy. It can be tied to narratives of individuation, of separation, of protecting your identity, honoring your mental health. So for the adult child, it's typically the adult child who initiates the estrangement, not the parent. It can be a positive. And most adult children who become estranged say that it is a positive experience. And virtually every single Strange parents say that it's a terrible, heartbreaking experience. And part of it's what you're pointing to is the shame that parents feel because they worry that if they tell somebody about it, they're going to say, well, you must have done something pretty terrible because kids don't 
cut off a parent unless they have really, you know, really good reasons for doing so, which is sometimes true, but it's just not always true. There are many pathways to estrangement beyond parental abuse or neglect or mistreatment. Well, I think I should come out of the closet, so to speak, because actually after my parents did something pretty nasty, which I don't think I'm going to talk about today, but I refused to speak to them only for about a month. It was after a bereavement. My partner died and I was just completely and utterly exhausted. I didn't have the energy to fight with them. But Actually, in the end, it was one of the best things I did because it gave us a bit of a reset. I mean, they I don't think they would have passed your program, but so I got no apology or anything else like that, but they did actually change. And actually, just thinking about my family in different generations, there's been chunks of time when different people haven't spoken to other people. So my suspicion is that it is actually a really underreported problem. I think it is. You know, there's certainly pain on the parent side, but I think, or shame rather, and there's shame on the adult child side as well, because they worry they'll be told, oh, family is forever. You only have one mother, one father, you know, you should, you're being selfish or being mean. So, so I agree with you. I think it is, I think it is grossly underreported. And I think that what is really difficult for parents is, is that they begin to doubt their old memories. You know, they think their child had a happy time. And, you know, look at this picture in the album. You know, look how happy we all are. And now all of that's been taken away. And that feels particularly painful. Did you go back through the family photograph album? Yes, but my daughter didn't really... Some adult children rewrite history. I mean, I knew what my daughter, you know, experienced and what she was describing. So there wasn't this big disparity in the narratives the way there are a lot of parents in my practice. A lot of parents in my practice, you know, will bring in letters where the adult child, like a year or so before, said, best mom ever, best dad ever. I'm so grateful for who you are. You've really, you know, been incredible. And then as a result of getting into therapy or their spouse not liking who they married or some other event are now kind of rewriting the childhood from their perspective. So those are often the most challenging things for parents when the adult child had up to a recent past said that the parent was a good parent and they described themselves as being close and feeling close. And now all of a sudden they're saying, no, I realized from my therapy or other experiences that you were just a narcissist and it's all about you and I can't have you in my life. That's not an uncommon scenario. I mean, I find that difficult to believe that therapists are going around throwing words like narcissist when they haven't actually even met these people. I wish I could say that your skepticism is well founded, but therapists are, um, we shouldn't, but therapists as a group are, you know, there's a variety of trainings, there's a variety of people who are serious about their practice and their education around it and their caution in terms of diagnosing people who aren't in there. And I I think therapy and therapists have become a huge part of estrangement because of the way that they believe that the person who's sitting in front of them is their only client that they have to be concerned about. And they're not thinking several generations down the line. So for example, as you said in the introduction, Andrew, that, you know, it's not uncommon that if an adult child cuts off a parent, they also cut off access to the grandchildren. So you know, I think as therapists, we have a responsibility not only to our, the client who's in front of us, but also to how those kinds of estrangements are going to affect the whole family system. In general, even if an estrangement is the healthiest thing for that adult child to do, it's still a cataclysmic event in the family system. It still divides them from grandparent from grandchildren. Siblings often kind of one will side with the parent, the other will side with the adult child. Grandparents get involved. They may get cut out as well. So it can really be a cataclysmic event of the whole family system. So tell me about your approach. Well, my approach is to really help parents to see that the old days of honor thy mother and thy father, respect thy elders and family is forever, is gone. And that today, if you want to have a good relationship with your adult child, you have to become much more psychological. You have to understand that relationships occur in the context of growth and identity and protection of self-esteem and the protection of mental health. And that nothing compels an adult child to have a relationship with that parent beyond whether or not that adult child wants that relationship. To that end, parents have to work much harder than they did in prior generations where they could kind of reasonably, you know, guilt trip their kid into into contact 
So, for example, when I moved from Dayton, Ohio to San Francisco in my early 20s, you know, my mother could reasonably call me and go, oh, Mr. Fancy Psychologist in San Francisco, you're too good to call your mother. I mean, we were close. (laughs) So, you know, so I would accept it from her. But today that would be considered like, you know, emotional abuse or something to to guilt trip your kid. Parents can no longer have that. They can no longer say after everything I did for you or you owe me, you know, so. My biggest method to, for parents is that you have to accept that you don't have the same kind of power that your parents' generation might have had, that you have to be much more psychological, and that if you're estranged, you have to be willing to find the kernel, if not the bushel of truth, in your children's complaints. You have to be able to be empathic, to take responsibility, to see it from their perspective, to not defend yourself, to not explain. It's, it's a big ask, and not every parent is capable or willing to do it, but there's no other way. Sometimes parents will say, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And it's like, I say, well, you can do whatever you want, but it's binary. To my perspective, you either do this and have a relationship with your child or you don't. There isn't a third option. Well, the third, you know, the third option is, no, it's not, it's not a third option. There's two options. You either do that and, and hope for a reconciliation or you don't do it and a reconciliation likelihood is very small. I mean, what I think is really wonderful reading your book is the amount of empathy you give to the parents about their own childhoods, because nine times out of 10, they've actually had quite a bit of pain from their own parents. They were controlling or abusive or, you know, they come from the era where, you know, getting a strap from behind the kitchen door was sort of perfectly normal. So they're actually carrying quite a lot of pain. You know, I put up with this. I mean, this was the words from, from my mother when we spoke after our break. She said, my mother did something that really hurt me, but because she didn't realise, I forgave her and didn't speak to her about it. So the expectation was that I would do the same thing. I mean, I was silently thinking, more fool you, but obviously I didn't say that. I just nodded sweetly. But the feeling is, you know, I sort of put up with all of that and I understood, and I've done half of that, and you are not trying to understand. And so I really feel that needs empathy because the old childhood hurts from the parents. Yeah, I think there's a lot to what you're saying, Andrew, first of all, that, you know, what parents often say to me is, you know, we would have never dreamed of cutting off our parents for things that were much more serious, where there was actual child abuse or actual neglect or actual harm. I mean, the culture has radically changed where there's always been estrangements, but not at this level and not where it's become kind of, a, you know, a really OK thing to do. Or it's a pathway to mental health and self-preservation the way it's characterized today. And I think in much of the world, that's still the case that estrangement, you know, we don't have great international research about it, but certainly in more collectivist, communitarian societies, say Asian cultures, for example, that have a much stronger sense of filial obligation, the idea that you would cut off a parent because they didn't meet your needs or because they're not in line with your ideals for identity and mental health would be considered completely bizarre. So I just think there's been a real sea change in family relationships that if parents want to heal the relationship with their adult child, they have to kind of get educated around. And especially if, for example, the child is gay or lesbian and previous generations would have hidden that. And thank goodness today we don't hide those sort of kind of things. But I mean, that is quite a barrier to get over for for some people if there's this sort of religious material tied up in all of that. How, How do you deal under those circumstances? Well, right. There's the religious, there's, yeah, there's gender identity, there's sexuality, there's also political differences in the U.S., for example. Some 16% of people became estranged just over political differences. So the, there's just so many ways that families can become divided. And again, it's, it's often much more incumbent on the parent for example, I will sometimes go with a parent who's like, you know, my child's an atheist and I'm deeply religious and I can't tolerate that or they want to marry somebody outside the faith, you know, and now they're saying they're not going to speak to me unless they do. But my faith is very important to me. And again, many, many of these things are they're binary. And I'll, I'll tell that to the parent. There's not a third option here. You can Your child knows that you object. You've already inculcated with their values. They disagree with your values. So if you want to say that you're not going to accept them because of that, First of all, 
you, you know, you should be aware of that, you know, particularly for uh, kids who are LGBT, that those kids, if they're rejected by the parent, their mental health is much worse and they have a much greater risk for homelessness and drug addiction and self-harm and, and suicidal ideation. So I'll tell parents that as well, that they can't just willy-nilly reject a kid because of their sexuality and expect that that's basically going to motivate the child. And it might, might motivate some, right? Some some children might remain closeted or say that, okay, I'll go along with it because either because the cultural demands on not separating from family are so strong or their own individual needs for the parents are so strong. But certainly that's that's not as common the case as, you know, in the United States that that kind of pressure is put on adult children. Yeah, I, I have clients who... Uh... Berlin is a very international city, so we have people who come from all over. And, you know, I have people whose parents have no idea what their lives are like, and they have no plans to tell them because they will be cut out. Right. And there's a huge lie at the centre of their relationship. And I think deep down, the parents actually know, but they prefer the lie than to have to go through with the cutting out, which is incredibly sad. It is sad, but we're also in an era where we believe that authenticity is such an important value. And I think other cultures and other eras didn't necessarily have that kind of an, an orientation. You know, I think the demands on family to have this very close, confiding, honest, open relationship is historically new and also culturally new. In other cultures and societies, there isn't that sort of demand for authenticity and transparency and and vulnerability. And often those are cultures where the filial senses of filial obligation are much, much stronger. And so it's more in the direction of the, the adult child having to respect the parent more than the, the parent respecting the adult child. So there's costs and consequences and, and to both. I mean, I think that in the same way that an egalitarian marriage is more the common kind of marriage today, and those people who can pull it off have happier, more fulfilling marriages. It also makes marriage more fragile because people can leave. Women are able to be self-employed. They can control their sexual reproduction. So that strengthens the hand of women to say what kind of marriage they want. But it also makes marriages more fragile in that sense, even though they can be more, more pleasurable and more, more deep, more profound in that sense. But the same is true of parent-adult child relationships. Earlier generations wouldn't have had the same kind of close confiding necessarily relationship that parents want with their adult children today. And those who get it have a wonderful relationship, probably better than than any other. I mean, I have incredibly close relationships with my adult children. And I'm deeply grateful for that. Um, it's a source of deep satisfaction and meaning to me. But, you know, not everybody can get it. I, and I have to sort of be more conscious and conscientious than my parents were. I know that I can't guilt trip, you know, my kids in the way that my mother could with me, for example. And so what do you suggest that parents do if they have a difficult relationship with a son or daughter-in-law? Well, it's a very common pathway to estrangement. So, you know, I heard one mother say, you have to keep your mouth shut and your purse open. And I think that's a just written <laughs> of wisdom in that you certainly have to keep your mouth shut. You can't really complain to your adult child about their spouse because you're just going to, first of all, they're probably going to tell their spouse and that's going to be ruinous for your relationship potentially. And you shouldn't complain to your child's spouse either. You have to sort of see that they're the gatekeeper to your access to your adult child and also your access to your grandchild. And they have to be treated like the new alpha in the family. So you can't go around them. You have to go through them. So sometimes parents will say, well, can I just have a relationship with my grandchildren and not my son or daughter-in-law or whatever? And the answer is typically no. Most, most adult children who have their own children aren't going to take that deal. They basically say, no, we're a package deal. You can't just have part of the family. You either heal things with me or you don't. So a big part of my methodology, Andrew, is to have parents write their adult child an amends letter where they, you know, just do all the things I was saying earlier, where they find the kernel, if not the bushel of truth. They apologize for the things that they did that were hurtful. They take responsibility. If they really don't understand, they say, I don't understand, but it's clear that I have blind spots. Will you help me? To understand a similar process is often necessary with a with a son-in-law or daughter-in-law who's the gatekeeper, particularly a son-in-law or daughter-in-law who's more troubled because they're the ones who are going to be 
most likely to put the relationship on a pathway to estrangement. So they in particular have to be handled with kid gloves and great diplomacy because writing a letter to them isn't necessarily going to work, but it may strengthen the spine of the son or daughter who's conflict avoidant and you know wants to just go along to get along, basically. And what, when you see the sons or daughters, what do you say to them? Do you say something to try and help them be more understanding of their parents? I don't. I mean, if I'm doing family therapy, what I call reconciliation therapy. So if it's the parent and the adult child and they're estranged and the adult child's willing to do family therapy with me, I will tell the parent in advance, this is not marriage therapy where you get to come in and have your own equal claims to what the relationship is going to look like and get to talk about your own boundaries and how hurt you feel and misunderstood. It's really much more like you've been married and the person's divorced and they're willing to give you another chance. It's going to be much more on their terms than on your terms. To the adult child, I say something similar, because often it's a matter of reassuring them that if they do the family therapy, that I have their back because, you know, they feel like they're estranged because they feel like the estrangement's working for them. So they're very often, you know, kind of skittish about getting in a room with their parents. So I will say, look, I've already told you your parents this, but I have your back. The goal of the therapy is to help your parents to have a deeper understanding of why you've needed to have this period of estrangement and to understand what has been healthy about it for you, the why it's been good for you, the why you've needed to do it. You know, and if I see your parent going off course, I will be all over them. I mean, my method is, you know, is kindly, but I'm not afraid of confrontation. And I tell the parents that in advance as well. Look, you know, if you see me confronting you or challenging you, it's because I feel like I'm observing that what you're doing is actually not in your best interest. Our goal is to persuade your child that being in contact with you is the right thing to do. And, you know, that if they do get back in contact with you, that that that's going to be a good relationship for them. So it's going to be about respecting their boundaries, honoring their perspective, understanding your impact on their childhood, even if it's very much at odds with your own. It's a big ask for the parent, but I don't think there's any other way. Yeah, I'm I'm just sitting here thinking of just how painful and difficult that would be. But then I'm also sitting here thinking of uh, several of my clients who have emotionally explosive parents who are very from you know what I get reported and obviously it's coming filtered but are very good at guilt tripping and manipulating yeah that would be all over their ass in a family therapy session and I've told parents look I can't support your kid being in contact with you if you can't do this very basic ask if you can't control your temper or not shame them or humiliate them or criticize them. I can't, in my own conscience, encourage them to stay in contact with you because I'm sort of setting them up to be emotionally abused by you. I don't typically have to do that because you know I think there's a self-sorting for people who, by the time they get to my office, they probably read my book or they know my method is what it is. But I have had, I have fired some parents and I've had parents fire me because they don't want to do it in the way that I think they have to do it. And I should imagine what often happens is one parent is for the program and one parent says, stuff it. Can you guess which gender is for and which one's against? (laughs) I think the women might be for it and the men have got more pride that that they cannot swallow. That's right. Yeah. In general, mothers, you know, I do webinars on Zoom and invariably it's filled with mothers. And the paradox is that... 26% 26% there was a study that was done in both Germany and the US. And so the 26% of fathers are estranged from a kid. 26%, that's one out of four fathers are estranged from a child. And yet it's mothers are the only ones showing up, you know, for the most part for my webinars, in part because the, the dictates of motherhood are just much higher. You know, for mothers are supposed to be, first of all, the kid came from them physically. And even though a mother's adopted, she still has that sort of a a feeling and the cultural feeling of motherhood, the feeling that you should always be doing something, that you should always internalize your child's accusations, and the deep feeling of shame. Whereas men, you know, we males tend to be bigger externalizers. We tend to get mad. We tend to blame. You know, we tend to get aggressive. And so a lot of dads aren't willing to do the kind of things. It's probably, there's a lot of reasons why fathers are more at risk to be estranged, but that's one of the reasons why fathers are, are more estranged, because they're not not as able or not as intuitive to do the kind of emotional walk that's required. And to be honest, most fathers have been underfathered themselves, so they don't really know how to be a father because, you know, they had a pretty 
crap dad themselves. So, you know, how on earth are they supposed to know what how to be a father? And this problem gets passed from one generation to the next generation and further down. No, I think it's true. And particularly given today's demands, which is that fathers need to be much more psychological, emotionally aware and, and sensitive. And to your point, you know, even today, parents don't tend to use as much emotional language with boys. They don't, they're not as physically affectionate with boys. They're not as empathic to their crime as they are to girls. So boys are still, despite our much more modern, contemporary, egalitarian psychological cultures in Western societies are still being deprived of the kind of psychological development that a lot of girls are. So in a moment, we'll continue this conversation and we'll have a look at a letter. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. Guess how long I've been helping couples have more fulfilling relationships? The answer shocked me. 39 years. Over this time, I've developed all sorts of interventions to help couples communicate better and make meaningful changes to protect and nurture their love. Some ideas I've used for a while and dropped, but at the core, there are a handful of must-haves that I use with all the couples I see face-to-face. Sadly, I can't work with everyone who wants my help, but I can share my best relationship tools. I've put them in a new course with worksheets and links to my most helpful podcasts. There are four hours of instructions to do at your pace together, with your partner or on your own. And it normally retails at £150. But to launch, I've dropped them to a special introductory price of £99.50. If you'd like to find out more, go to andrewgmarshall.com forward slash tools and get started on improving your relationship. Get great deals on all your favorite items throughout the store at Safeway. This week at Safeway, get value packs of USDA Choice Boneless Beef Top Sirloin Steak for $4.97 per pound with digital coupon Limit 1. Plus, get Foster Farms Boneless Skinless Chicken Breasts, available in the Butcher Block for $1.97 per pound with digital coupon. Also this week, mix or match selective varieties of Oro Wheat Variety Bread or Artisano Bread, 20 to 24 ounces, or buy one, get one free when you buy two. Visit Safeway.com or head in store for more deals. New Yorkers and visitors alike are heading to New York City's extraordinary experience that you have to feel to believe. Summit One Vanderbilt, an interactive multi-level experience of art, sky, and exploration. Discover exhilarating heights, explore reflective spaces, walk among floating silver orbs, and immerse yourself in spectacular views of New York. Book your visit at summitov.com and start your journey here. So here's a letter that's been uh, sent in, which is about estrangement. We're looking at this actually the opposite way round now. I've been with my wife for 11 years, and over that time, our relationship with her mother, my mother-in-law, has deteriorated to the point where we have no contact with her. My mother-in-law was always opinionated and controlling with her daughter, and I accepted this was how she was and got on with setting out to win her heart, supporting her daughter and showing her grandsons would want for nothing and have a wonderful role model to guide them. I would take my mother-in-law on holidays and out for meals, but nothing was good enough. There were the general comments about the things I did in my life, the car I bought for my wife, the floor I installed in the living room, even the light bulbs in our new house. The list goes on. She used to say things like, Oh, you wouldn't do for me. I couldn't be married to you in front of my wife and kids. On occasion, I would put a boundary in place. Examples of these are, Please, would you make sure the grandchildren brush their teeth if they stay over with you? They started to have dental issues. Please, would you not give the children too many sweets and treats? She used to give them a carrier bag full each week. These requests were met with explosive rage and indignation with my wife complaining she'd been put in the middle of it and there would be friction for a while. Before things returned to exactly how they were before, with her ignoring the requests, 
and doing whatever she wanted. After seven years, we hit a massive crisis in our marriage and ended up having marriage counselling, individual therapy, and had to do a whole lot of work on ourselves and our marriage. My mother in law looked after the children, so we decided to tell her what was going on. This was a terrible decision. As it turns out, she told people about our problems, then denied it and lied about it. She eventually admitted that she may have mentioned it in passing on occasion to people, but never apologised or took any responsibility. We have since put down healthy boundaries and enforced them. We are a united front. My mother-in-law hates the boundaries and has tried everything to circumnavigate them. Eventually we had enough. Enough of the explosive reactions and the dramas and enough of the comments the situation was starting to affect our children. We suggested counselling, mediation, but this was refused. Our lives are more peaceful since we went no contact. However, we do feel guilty because our children hardly ever see her, and she is their grandmother after all, and they miss her. We can't heal the rift if she won't talk about it, and she can't rebuild any trust if she won't stick to the boundaries we set. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think it raises a number of issues, Andrew. I think the first is that this letter has a lot in common with most of the letters that I see from adult children, which is where they say that their decision to cut off the parent, and and this is what they say in research in general, you know, is much healthier for them, much better for them. They feel better. They feel less stressed out. And, you know, it may well be true. But again, I think we have to think about this both at the, at the individual level and the societal level, because what the couple is also saying is that their children miss their grandmother and their grandmother misses the children. And we don't get to have perfect family members. Sometimes our family members are really troubled and they're difficult and they're impossible and they're overreactive in the way that she is. I mean, my own standard is a sort of short of physical abuse, if somebody's capable of being a good grandparent, and being a good grandparent doesn't mean they do everything that you want. I mean, my attitude is, okay, so they, she gives them, unless she's babysitting for them every single day, if she sees them once a week and gives them sweets, it's not going to kill the kids or, you know, or whatever. I mean, I'm sympathetic to the parents. Trust me, if it was my mother, I'd be pissed off at her as well. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I feel no judgment from the parents. But I think we also have to think, you know, several generations down the line. There's a lot of great grandparents who are really shitty parents. And this may be one of those cases where this is a really difficult mother and mother-in-law. And doesn't sound, she sounds completely unrepentant, unwilling to take responsibility to hear the parents, you know, her son-in-laws and daughters, very reasonable limits. She's just incorrigible and she always will be incorrigible. They've tried really hard. They tried setting limits and now they've cut off her completely, which first of all, is probably a source of enormous torment to her. You know, even if she comes across as being this kind of self-centered, bold, aggressive person, She's probably in enormous pain, and that has to be thought about, you know, at the societal level, even if not at the individual level. And the grandchildren as well are likely in enormous pain, and she misses her grandchildren. So there's a lot of people that are pretty good, valuable grandparents who are not fantastic parents or even lousy parents. And, you know, at the societal level, I think we have to be thoughtful about that. Now, that might mean that the parents, you know, have to continue to think about ways to to limit the mother, if they're going to be in contact with her, you know, to limit the ways that she's explosive or difficult or whatever. But they also have to accept that that's kind of who she is. She's never going to change and they get to decide. But, you know, I just think at a societal level, we have to think about the whole generational issue. So what I was thinking about this was, first of all, what your relationship with your own parents is like, because you seem to have a huge desire to be liked. You know, you set out to win her over. I have to say, I had a difficult mother-in-law and I never tried to win her over because she was not the sort of person you could win over. So (laughs) I treated her with respect and love, but I never set that kind of goal because well, it was a pretty, you know, it was an Olympic task. So, so, you know, why, why go there? Because actually what counts is how you feel. If you are a good husband and you provide well for your family and a good role model, that's good enough. You don't need the housekeeping seal of approval from your mother-in-law. And, you know, to be honest, you wouldn't want to be married to her either. So I sort of want to laugh at what she's saying because 
You know, it is so preposterous. And sometimes a laugh is actually sort of rather de-stressing because, you know, she's behaving like she's seven years old, to be perfectly honest, your mother-in-law. And, you know, she seems like a small child that expects you to regulate her feelings for her. She sounds, you know, as I say, like a spoilt child herself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if she doesn't get her own way, she throws a tantrum. So if you are sort of a little less caring about what she thinks about you, I think that diffuses things a huge amount. You know, why do you need her approval? Because trust me, you don't need it. <laughs> so if you can sort of take that little step back, and what I would really like to hear would be for you to speak to your wife and to actually say, you know, how's this going for you? Truthfully, you know, I'm a big boy. I can hear exactly what you think. You know, I sometimes say to clients, we'll do on the one hand this and on the other hand that. So on the one hand, it's actually peaceful. But on the other hand, you know, I do worry about her as she's getting older mm -hmm. sort of kind of thing. And keep going like that so that your wife feels that she can actually talk about exactly how she's feeling. The third thing I want to talk about is boundaries, because I think boundaries is a term that our generation understands, but previous generations haven't got the first idea what boundaries are. So the kind of boundaries that can be imposed are your own boundaries. You can't actually set boundaries for other people, particularly people who've got the emotional age of seven years old or possibly even younger. So you can't say, you can't do this, but you can, in your for yourself, you know, put the phone down if somebody crosses a line, they say rude things about you. You're in control of your boundaries, you put the phone down. You can't stop them from saying it, but you can say, uh, you know, you can decide I'm not going to listen to this. So think about your own boundaries rather than trying to set boundaries for her and what would those look like? And maybe talk with your wife about you know, what's my zone of control when it comes to my mother-in-law? You know, how many sweets she gives? Well, that's not in your zone of control. What is in your zone of control is possibly frisking the children as they come through the door afterwards <laughs> or having a, a, negotiating a deal with the children that you're going to have a sweet tax. You know, it's a 90% sweet tax as they come through the door. But that's in your zone of control that you can negotiate a deal with the children. So, Think about what's in your zone of concern and what's in your zone of control, because I think sometimes you're focusing too much on what's in your zone of concern rather than what's in your zone of control. I don't know. What do you think about that? No, I like that. I like the distinction between the zone of concern and the zone of control. I think there's, there's a lot of wisdom in that. You know, the other thing I think is that I think younger generations of parents are too worried about the impact of the grandparent. I mean, obviously, if the grandparent lives in their house and is with them every single day for hours at a time, you know, they're going to have a certain amount of authority in the grandchildren's eyes. But if they're the occasional, like the vast majority of grandparents, it's an occasional time, even if it's a few times a week, you know, they, they'll have some influence. But typically, parents are the ones that are going to have the primary influence on the child in terms of their tastes and their attitudes and their behaviors and the like. So, I just don't think that younger generations of parents need to be so worried about the way that their parents are going to affect their children. I mean, obviously, unless they're just doing something that's clearly egregiously hurtful and destructive, but there's a lot of control that I see younger generations making. It's just kind of like, gosh, do you really want to have, a, you know, it's like, okay, so your, your mother-in-law gives your kids more sweets than you like, or lets them watch more TV or spend more time on the screens. Nobody died you know, from that. I mean, it's understandable you'd be annoyed by it, but it's not the end of the world. So put your energy elsewhere. Kind of thing. So I'll tell you something shocking. My grandmother actually used to own a sweet shop. So can you imagine <laughs> what we got? <laughs> we could go into that sweet shop and we could have anything we wanted. Wow. And actually what's fascinating is after a certain amount of time, you don't want anything. Right. That's the thing, right? So I hope that's been helpful for you. So we're beginning to get towards the end of our discussion. So I need to ask you, as a witness on The Meaningful Life, what makes your life meaningful? Oh, it's a good question. I'm very blessed to have close childhood 
friends. Um, I have some friends that I've known since I was three and a cohort of five guys that I've been friends with most since either I was 17 or in my mid 20s and I'm going to be 70 this year. So these are friends I've had for, you know, 50, 60 plus years and we get together regularly and they're they're like my real brothers. I mean, I have brothers, but these are, you know, kind of brothers one would really, really want. We've traveled the world together. We've gone on cycling trips. We get together for dinner almost weekly. We've helped each other through our divorces, through raising our children, through dealing with ex-wives, through dealing with our adult children, through our marital difficulties. And, you know, I think a lot of men miss out on how rich it is to have friends that you can really confide deeply in. We've cried with each other. We've confronted each other. You know, we're all kind of no bullshit with each other. So we've all confronted other members at various times and they've needed confrontation. So that's a deep source. I'm happily married to my wife of 35 years. She's a deep, lovely, kind person. And, and we've had plenty of issues in our earlier years. What I often say is I've been you know, married for 35, happily married for 25, because the first <laughs> years we came close to divorcing many times over, in part around blended family issues. But she's a very kind, decent person. And then my work is deeply meaningful, helping estranged families. There's nothing more meaningful to me than being able to help a parent and adult child who were formerly estranged to become reconciled or even to help somebody who's estranged to just feel a greater sense of peace and acceptance. So those are three deep sources of meaning for me. I often say that the one thing that most men need is more friends. No and question. I'm sitting here feeling jealous. <laughs> No, I might feel lucky because I think it's not. Most men don't have a lot of close friends and it's, it is a blessing for sure. So our conversation is going to continue in a moment. We're going to talk about how to get men to take an equal share of parenting. Joshua's written a really interesting book about men parenting and housework. We're going to talk about that in a moment. If you want to hear the bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and unlock the bonus material this way, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you. Get great deals on all your favorite items throughout the store at Safeway. This week at Safeway, get value packs of USDA Choice Boneless Beef Top Sirloin Steak for $4.97 per pound with digital coupon Limit 1. Plus, get Foster Farms Boneless Skinless Chicken Breasts, available in the Butcher Block for $1.97 per pound with digital coupon. Also this week, mix or match selective varieties of Oro Wheat Variety Bread or Artisano Bread, 20 to 24 ounces, or buy one, get one free when you buy two. Visit Safeway.com or head in store for more deals. Some people may call it the simple life. We know it's anything but simple. There's always work to be done. Grass to mow, gravel to spread, gardens to till, snow to blow, hay to bale, bales to stack, hose to dig, loads to haul. And you need a reliable, versatile, easy-to-use tractor for every season. Do it all with a John Deere 5 Series tractor. Contact your local John Deere dealer to learn more.